Hello, welcome everybody. Okay. Thanks for coming and for finding what is not our normal venue for the enlightening lunches. Um, a real uh, pleasure and privilege today to introduce our speaker, Craig Calhoun. Uh, Craig is a university professor uh, at ASU, which means he is not attached to any individual academic unit, but in fact to five. I'll let him rattle those off if he really wants to. But one of them is the School for the Future of Innovation Society, and we're really pleased to have the important 20% of Craig, the one that the 20% that brings him here uh, to talk to you today. Um, among uh, the many important things that uh, Craig has done before being at ASU was being the president of the Social Science Research Council. Um, he was the president of um, the London School of Economics. And there's something that comes after the economics, but I never forget. I never remember what that is. And political science. And political science. And I'm a political scientist. There you go. Um, and, you know, having observed Craig in uh, at least a couple of situations around ASU, um, I am really pleased to say that um, you know I did not get to observe him in, in those uh, uh, leadership roles at those other institutions, um, but he is here seemingly incredibly relaxed, incredibly comfortable, um, uh, happy in his new role here where he gets to choose uh, basically whatever he wants to do. And he's going to talk about what it is that he wants to do, um, some of his agenda for the future uh, with us for the next uh, short hour or so. As just one lead into this, and I know that um, Craig may know this already, and that probably has something to do with his being here. Uh, ben may know this already. Um, but just for the rest of you, something that has been a real point of pride at ASU around the social sciences in the last number of years. Do people know what the um, NSF herd rankings are? They're not rankings of large mammals and groups. Uh, they're the higher education research and development rankings. And in the social sciences, uh, ASU has been performing incredibly well in this regard over the last several years. Uh, almost surprisingly so when we uh, sort of first, as a university, first understood this was going on a couple of years ago. So there are new rankings coming out in uh, November of 2018. But in the rankings that came out last year, uh, reflecting back on fiscal year 2016, where do you think ASU ranked nationally in, in, in all expenditures in the social sciences? Does anybody know this number? Gary, do you know this number? First 10, second 10, third 10 nationally. What do you think? 25. First 10, second 10, third 10. First 10, much higher than 25. Um, last year in uh, total expenditures in the social sciences, ASU was fourth in the country, according to these rankings. Um, simply measuring uh, federally funded expenditures ranked ninth. There are other expenditures that go into uh, the fourth ranking from the university, from non-federal sources, and so on. And so that is you know, really an incredible number when you think about who else is at the top of that category. The category, of course, is led by University of Michigan. Um, uh, but there are, you know, you're, you're ahead of a lot of interesting places when you're uh, fourth or ninth. And uh, I think, you know, the ability to uh, attract Craig here is related to that, that Craig represents uh, a real vision of the social sciences here that is an important vision, important contribution that ASU is making um, when sometimes the change that's gone on in this university over the past number of years has been you know, focused a lot on science and engineering. So thank you uh, very much, Craig, for uh, arriving at ASU and for uh, uh, talking to us today. Okay, thank you. I like this being thanked for arriving at ASU. Um, I don't know the format or history of enlightening lunches, therefore I'm going to ignore um, any of that. But that's at odds with what I want to speak about and in many ways work on, which is um, reinvention, a term that gets used, you know, big banner outside the library, used a lot. I want to um, take it seriously in a certain way, and I'll start with that, then I'm going to give an example and 
um, to talk about some related things. Um, but I could, I could start even with the herd rankings. So congratulations. Um, congratulations to whichever three of you got the really big grants that drive this. Um, and, uh, um, and, and begin with things like the herd rankings. So there's always something to be unpacked. Right? So an expenditure ranking um, is not an impact ranking. It's um, a, a ranking of one dimension. And it will have its own particular skewedness. Uh, it turns out that if you um, study expenditures on science and technology, not just social science, any kind of research expenditures, but actually it turns out to be true in all sorts of other domains, um, there is a disproportionate impact of a small number of large projects. Um, and this will turn out to be true if you study construction projects. It will turn out to be true in a variety of domains. It's a sort of standard um, effect of that. Um, I suspect that ASU's strong standing is correlated with the brilliance of every individual faculty member um, and every PhD student. It's also correlated with the a really good feature of social science here, which is the extent to which it's connected in various ways um, to other parts of science and technology and engineering. Um, and this both affects the dollar amounts um, and some of the creativity that's going on there. Um, but I begin with that partly to say the um, for everything, including our own rankings and self-evaluations, these unpackings are important. Partly that some of the unpackings of any kind of concept or ranking or, or uh, account of things will involve um, merely law-like patterns. Um, so the kind of geometry of the impact of the small number of very large amounts on this. I've thought about this in my previous life before I became so relaxed when I was university president um, doing fundraising um, and uh, um, observed the extent to which meeting targets of millions and millions of dollars of fundraising is largely about a small number of very large gifts. Okay. Um, and if you want to uh, alumni donations from all your alumni, but most of your alumni, if you're lucky, give you $100, and only a few um, give you $10 million and upward and so forth. Now, this kind of, of more or less geometric, quasi-axiomatic uh, phenomenon is a part of unpacking. And then there are all sorts of context-specific and culturally specific um, features, too. Um, and a lot of those get studied by relatively cheap research. So um, I'm in favor of um, the success in the herd rankings. I'm in favor of the really big projects. I actually think in some cases, um, we probably even should think bigger in how we connect up and do this. But I'm also, uh, at ASU, hope that I will be connected to a bunch of people who do relatively cheap research. Um, I don't mean people who fail to submit proposals when they should, um, but I mean people who are thinking, for example, about the theoretical implications of uh, projects that are pursued. There are large-scale empirical projects, but where there are relatively focused questions of theoretical, um, conceptual, sometimes kind of methodological impact that will get less money um, but will be very significant for how much of the larger work matters in social science and in general. My particular interest um, as I come to this is in how we choose or at least shape our futures. So the School for the Future Innovation Society is a really crucial um, appointment for me because it's about something fairly close to the heart of my own interests. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit about how I do that. Uh, but I have to say that, um, uh, by way of uh, fair warning, I um, am possessed of a really annoying uh, biography of uh, curriculum vitae in which I've worked um, on all manner of different things. So if you go by topics, it looks like I have studied a um, hundred different things with Peloton. But I've studied a small number of things about a hundred of different topics. Um, so that I've looked at um, issues um, like network phenomena um, across a wide range of empirical domains. Um, and um, I am not necessarily the master of each of any of those. But a lot of this comes together for me around um, what I'm going to talk about today, but I could describe as the, um, the scales of sociality 
Um, that is the impact of scale itself, which is why I tried to make that sort of passing herd of reference there. Um, the, um, and the ways in which the social, say, social impact, social dimensions, the social organizations things, is organized across a variety of different <coughs> scales. It's not in itself a scale. Um, and um, I mentioned it from you know, the scale of bodies and concrete, you know, individual people and so forth, even below that, um, through to global affairs. Partly because I think the way we have divided up our attention obscures from us some of the interdependence of these different things. So that the discussions of local communities, say the creative place-making discussions that take place at ASU, and that go on not just as a domain of academic scholarship, but then inform things like, what are we going to build in Mesa, um, are disconnected from global political economy discussions, as though that happens somewhere else, right? but it happens actually in an interdependent way. Um, so let me not be so abstract. <coughs> How can we choose or at least shape our future? How can we do that consciously? There's a sort of default model in which all sorts of um, unintended effects accumulate. We take decisions and we do our things individually. We buy things and sell things and markets result that nobody is intentionally creating the whole market. And so lots of change happens this way. Um, some of it is driven by um, extremely powerful individuals or those sorts of peculiar quasi-individuals, corporations of various kinds. Um, but I'm interested in to what extent can large numbers of people consciously choose their futures as a problem in democracy and the very idea of democracy. Can we choose the institutions under which we live? Can we choose the frameworks in which we live? And I'm interested in how that then connects from uh, the socially organized processes like voting to technologically organized processes, the infrastructures, and to what extent we can choose our futures by choosing the infrastructural arrangements that underpin what we do. Um, infrastructural arrangements, whether we're talking about plumbing or transportation or communication or whatever else, get chosen a lot of ways, but they are very seldom the focus of a collective, more or less democratic decision making. Um, they are byproducts of various kinds of market activities. They are objects of finance and investment, public private partnerships, there are bond issues, lots of things. Um, they drive lots of what goes on in society. Think of the building of railroads in the middle of the 19th century, driving an integration of the United States that has large scale political impacts um, on things like Arizona becomes a state, right? <laughs> Um, but also um, is a massive financial venture so that much of what we know of things like the bond market um, has as a major point of its formation the railroad era and the effort to finance railroads and the modern corporate structure so that um, the railroads and its related firms including finance become templates for building corporations. But the railroads was relatively popular, it wasn't itself the object of a choice and the choice of the future, except in these dispersed ways. We now have various new infrastructure development projects. And um, they are, from my point of view, um, extremely influential in shaping the society we live in. Right? So you know, can we in any way do this? Uh, can we consciously, collectively, fairly choose the future? I'm interested in official processes like voting and other more or less official standard political science democratic processes. But I'm also interested in the roles played by uh, public culture, public debates, by public message, by social movements, and by the role of knowledge in all of this. I'm not going to talk about those in any depth today. As I just to enlarge the terrain, if we want to talk about collective choice, we aren't just talking about a meeting in which we choose or an election in which we choose. We're talking about participating in processes that change how we think about things, how others think about things. Um, and there may be organization and social movements around that. There is um, often a role of knowledge 
the role of knowledge is usually less great than researchers think it should be. Um, so that uh, we like to imagine that there is a path that goes from the sort of research we do through to the decisions that are made in Congress. Um, but it's um, not an extraordinarily direct or powerful uh, path and a lot of other factors in this. But there's also a world of, of imagination and institutions. I'm thinking here of some of the world-making projects that Dave and others have begun to bring forward, where we are making the world, that's just literally what I mean by choosing the conditions under which we want to live, in a whole variety of ways, in material ways, as we make technologies, and I'm going to suggest in a moment, remake ourselves, um, but also in relation to images, and understanding, and culture, so film, and literature, and a whole variety of um, processes of communication can be grouped together what I would call social imaginaries. Um, that is, in socially organized ways of imagining. So we often tend to think that imagination is the opposite of being socially organized and determined. Um, it's the free-floating daydreams that you have when you're not doing something else. Even those right, have social influences. But there are also lots of ways in which we are um, dependent on social imaginaries, dependent on collectively organized, collectively reproduced ways of imagining. Let me just tie that back to the formal processes. What is voting, right? Voting is a technical procedure. There are rules about who can vote. There are hanging chads. There are equipment issues, right? But it's also based on a social imagination in which we imagine things like one person, one vote. We know what people are doing when they raise their hands in certain contexts informally, right? We have a serial <coughs> image, right? So voting incorporates into it the notion of um, different individuals counting the same, and um, it incorporates usually into it distinctions from market power, from wealth, and what you can do. Right? My point is only that there is a whole imagination, and it goes back to imagining what people are, right? to really sort of basic kind of things. That people are individuals. You can line them up in a series. They're equivalents to each other. Therefore, it makes sense to count their votes. If you didn't think people were, in some sense, equivalent to each other, voting would make no sense. Right? So it's reproduced in part in that, and then it, in turn, reproduces it by participating. Um, we could go through a variety of other ways of thinking imaginations. Let me just choose one. Um, I referred to corporations as a quasi-individual. One of the ways of imagining what a corporation is, is to think of it as an artificial person. This is a relatively old tradition. Um, it's been given new life in the Citizens United decision of the US Supreme Court and in other settings. Citizens United, you may recall, gave corporations, recognized corporations, as citizens of a, kind, of a kind that are subject to the civil liberties and, um, the, in particular, the right of free speech. And so that the corporations could not be governed differently from human individuals with regard to their political freedom of speech. The underlying issue was could you have restrictions on corporate donations to campaigns, donations that are interpreted as speech, right? And the decision indicates that um, corporations are free speech. Now I want to replay the Supreme Court decision. Right? What I want to do is just notice right? that's not something you can observe in the world. It's not an empirical fact. Um, it is a constitutive declaration. This is what corporations are. There are various other ideas. It's interesting that that particular understanding of corporation um, emerges. But there are two other big ones not meaning to talk about corporations. The two other big ones are corporations are um, uh, delegations of authority from the state. So a lot of the history of corporate law is that states, which are monarchs, recognize corporations. Right? And that the act of recognition by the sovereign is what calls the corporation into being. There's a charter, for example. And many corporations, not just businesses, but universities have this. It may not be everyday knowledge that the foundational case of corporate law in the United States involves Dartmouth, actually, 
Um, and Justice Marshall, the beginning of the 19th century, writing that a corporation is a person that has not a soul to damn nor a body to kick. Um, and that it has to be treated in a distinctive way. Now, what are the big issues there? It's collective liability. It's right now. The issue there is that the corporation can shield individuals from liability. It becomes crucial to business corporations, even though it's initially decided for a university, because in general, if you own stock in a company that does something bad, they can't come after you, right? You can lose the value of your stock, but you can't lose any more. That's a whole history of thinking corporations that way. The other way of thinking of corporations is a creature of contract. You and a certain number of other people want to form a corporation, for the most part, the state can't deny you the right to do that. You meet certain legal requirements, and you enter into a contract to create a company. Um, and then there's the contract law. Now, I use this only to illustrate that we have these three different imaginary ways of thinking about corporations, which call into being and are conditions of the existence of corporations, right? So Google and General Motors and Tesla and General Electric and these things exist. They are materially significant. I'm not saying, oh, no, they're just you know, immaterial features of imagination. But they exist because they're imagined and on the condition of a continued imagining of them. If we stop thinking they were real on these or other grounds, then in a certain sense, they would be vulnerable to not being real. Right? The assets would still be there, the factories, things like that. But the legal standing is itself constituted for being a corporation. The, and imagination is there. It's not just a series of precedents. It is a socially organized process of imagining, whereby now we take it as sort of automatically the fact that corporations can hold property, right, that they can sue or be sued with human individuals, um, that they can enter into contracts, and so forth. And so we reproduce in our dealings with corporations a world in which a certain imagined being is a very important and powerful kind of actor. So when we talk about social imaginaries, we're not talking about sort of the trimmings at the edges of society, and we're not talking um, about just a realm of freedom, we're talking about how some very powerful things in society come into being. I can tell a similar story for nation states, uh, for both nations and states, and that hyphenated creature, the nation state, that in many ways, um, you can't find it. You can't go look and sort of find them in the world. You can find various refractions of them. Um, the uh, lines that are drawn on maps are on the maps, not on the ground, for the most part. Right? But that doesn't mean you can wish them away and say, oh, well, governments, they don't matter. Um, nations, they don't have any following. Right? They do. Right? They're creatures of imagination. So the work of imagination right, is often socially organized and constrained. Right? You can't just start saying, well, I refuse to imagine business corporations or nations. Um, they're there in some significant but that they're collectively in our imagination, in our heads, as well as in a series of material relationships and more or less formal decisions, um, like um, legal precedence. Now, this suggests a way of thinking about the institution of society, about the role of different institutions in society. When we're talking about business corporations or universities or nation states or others. We are talking about phenomena that exist in this um, complex way. We inhabit, we dwell in this world and in these relations to them. Um, now, um, let me move forward. Um, I'll just hold the thought of, of social imaginaries, if you will, and let me move into a couple of other related topics. Um, one of the implications of this is that to understand dramatic societal transformations, such as those we're living through, we have to understand transformations in how we think and how our thinking is itself influential in the social change. So let me just evoke um, that we are, and I'm going to claim, we are living through a variety of nonlinear social transformations. They are transformations in very basic ways. So climate change, environmental change, structures that are 
changing the habitat of the lives, economy, the transformations of capitalism, states and polities, lots of pressures on the structures, both of international relations, domestic states, social and family relations, right? Human beings themselves, bodies, right, are not as stable as we think. At every one of these levels, we tend to treat things as more, as fairly fixed. They are fixed because there is a lot of reproduction that goes into keeping them the same. But there are potentials for change and for unraveling change. We'll just take bodies for a moment as an example, since this is one of the areas um, I'm working on, right? What does it mean to say bodies change? I don't just mean we have better nutrition and we therefore get taller, or we have the wrong kind of nutrition and we get fatter. Um, but I mean, the way we think of the human is there. When I talked about a corporation, I said, following Justice Marshall and in fact following a whole body of law, we work with an analogy to real people, to natural human beings. But human beings aren't quite as completely natural as we might think in that regard. And in various ways they change. Right now, genetic engineering is offering a capacity to remake the human by remaking genetic makeups. It poses a variety of social challenges and questions. For example, who has the authority to decide if the future genetic makeup of, of a gamete of an as yet unborn, um, um, unbeing, right, a, a potential human being? Interestingly, in the United States and in almost all um, OECD countries, the answer is parents. And the answer is on the basis of property law. Um, so that there's a somewhat surprising development in which we, in general, do not treat human beings as property. Um, but we don't have another recourse for the construction of the parental right to decide on the genetic make of the baby. And I don't have any other recommendations. It's not like, oh, it shouldn't be parents, it should be the state, or it should be the market, or it should be whatever else. But it is the point that we have a way of imagining an inheritance in thinking about families um, that goes back to children as useful labor and income sources for the family and who would own the rights that come from that, but that comes into play now as we try to decide a new hard technological question. So the technology, CRISPR and so forth, is there to make these genetic changes. We have questions about who should choose, how we would choose, and what should we choose. We have almost no regulation. I talked about interconnections of scale. Right? It's going to be very hard to sort this out um, just in one country because there will be medical tourism. There already is medical tourism. Um, there is already a growing international provision of fertility support um, that can be easily turned into and is being turned into um, genetic uh, modification and enhancement of offspring support. So you can evade, it's easy to evade the laws. It's easy if you have the money, right? So right now, we distribute access to the technology largely on the basis of money. We decide, China may decide to distribute it on the basis of state organized decision making. China's actually moving into the lead in this technology globally, so that will matter. Now, the point about it all is though, part of what matters in it, in the part that's which is this social imagining. What is the human? There's a whole history to trying to imagine the human by comparing human beings to mechanical contraptions, for example, or by comparing human beings to other animals. These are breaking down. The world of artificial intelligence, the world of um, various kinds of, of technologies that are incorporated into bodies, nanotechnologies and others, begins to break down the simple opposition to mechanism. The world of artificial intelligence begins to break down um, ideas like, oh, well, human beings have status because they're intelligent. Right? What does that mean in relation? You're more intelligent than your dog, so you can own your dog, but your dog can't own you. Well, that's in challenge and in play, too. There are a whole cluster of these technologies and of large-scale um, issues of global political economy that are reorganizing what it means to be human. And this gets played out, will get played out, I think, a lot in court cases. It's not very effectively played out proactively in regulation. Um, in some other systems, it may be more, but in general, that's not. Um, 
and it's played out, I think, in imagination. There is a high stakes question of what do we think people are. Um, and um, this is a part, I think, of any discussion of uh, technological dimensions of transformation and creating the future. Now, let me move more directly to technology. I know I'm sort of at a very abstract level of this, and I'm never going to get to the concrete case today, so there you are. The, um, Technology, I think it's no controversial assertion in this community to say technology is always already social. But it's interesting how often we make a division, which we want to talk about the social impact of a technology as though the technology weren't always already social in various important ways. Um, and I think we followed through the genetic engineering. We see this in various ways in AI. We see it. Take AI for a moment to well, it's artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence has been imagined in a remarkably asocial way, with almost no imagining of the social. Imagining intelligence as something that's in your head, that is your brain. Right? Imagining that if we could produce silicon-based computer systems that can outperform this carbon-based organic brain, we are talking about the singularity, we're talking about a transformation in intelligence. And what that leaves out, I'm not, I don't have a, an argument to make one way or the other about the common sort of artificial intelligence question. Do we have five years or 10 years or 20 years before we're passed by the computers? We're passed in some ways already, others not close. The point I want to make, though, is that the imagining of intelligence is sort of flawed in Right. This is an argument known in artificial intelligence circles, the expanded intelligence argument. But basically, think of language. It's not in our singular heads. None of us contains the English language in his or her brain. We have capacities to use it. We have some of the vocabulary, not other parts. We use it on the basis of generative principles and rules that we can't articulate. We participate in a shared phenomenon of intelligence in various ways that isn't contained entirely in individual brains. So merely reproducing individual brains doesn't get it. Now, parts of the artificial intelligence research community are very keenly aware of this, actively engaged in trying to think differently about it. The point was more to illustrate the always already social character of the technology, which you can start out imagining as though it's discrete. Intelligences are discrete things. Dave has one, and Rob has one, and Lisa has one, and you know, we measure them with IQs. There's a whole practice devoted to reproducing the notion of these discrete intelligences, which obscures the extent to which actually mean intelligence is a shared phenomenon with other people, necessarily, um, which has then implications for the technology and implications for how we think about the human. And just to add very briefly to that, the there are also blurred boundaries. Right? That the new technological transformations are imagined as more discreet than they are. So AI is over in that corner, and uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing is in that corner, and there's some neuroscience work going on here, and people are building artificial exoskeletons in them, but there were some people doing nanotechnological quasi-pharmaceutical work. Right? These are all blurring together, right? the technology itself. AI is the platform for doing lots of the other technological work. You can't do genetic engineering without relying on some level of artificial intelligence in the platform structures for doing it. Um, they are mixed. So we have this overly discrete way of thinking about things. Um, the, I mean, to illustrate, I was on the, Arizona State had one of the two um, major um, NSF funded centers for looking at the social impact of uh, nanotechnology. I was on the board of the other one in Santa Barbara for a number of years. What I want to just use that to illustrate is the extent to which, from the point of view of technological development, the social looked as a, a source of impact or resistance or maybe financing, right? But not embedded in the technology itself and how you think about it, how it's developed, the social processes by which it's made what gets made and what doesn't. I'm sort of basically just suggesting we need that broader understanding. We also need to contend with the skewing of our thinking 
buy the romance of the new. So for every technology, we look at it one way when it's new and hot and cool, and we call it innovation. We have the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, right? And another way of looking at it when it becomes an infrastructure, when it becomes old and boring and in need of updating um, and expensive maintenance and a constraint. Um, so we tend often to do our studies of technologies in ways that are shaped by which of those categories we think things are, right? So um, all new architectures, like, ah, it's all part of the cool, new, innovation, romantic, exciting possibilities. Yet a huge amount of what actually is done with artificial intelligence is the partial automation of infrastructures of the same old air travel, um, train travel, highways, right? all manner of infrastructures, material engineering projects. So we think, oh, those electronic engineers, those computer scientists are cool, those civil engineers, not as cool. In fact, right, not as separate in all of this. Um, now, let me go to my last bit to talk about my specific engagement and talk about community and reinvention. So I'm interested in the ways in which we have some ability to choose our future. Increasingly, we only have it if we have an ability to choose the way in which technology plays in our future. We only have that if we grasp the extent to which technology is not just innovations and cool new things, but transformations of infrastructure. That technology is remaking the underpinnings of our lives. And that our imagination play a role in this, giving us access, giving us a way of grasping it, giving us a way to think about change, or perhaps obscuring it from us, making it hard for us to see what's going on, respond to it. And uh, one arena for thinking about this is community. Communities are quintessentially thought of, uh, imagined, as organic, not chosen. They, they happen. They are, they are always already there sense. But there are planned communities, and there are urban renewal projects, and there are various efforts to reinvent and rejuvenate the community. Um, but the predominant imagination is of something organic. That's deeply embedded in sociology and some other parts of social science with the notion that community is um, in an opposition to large-scale society. Community and society, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, we have traditional and modern. A sort of notion of community is that which we organically inherit right? um, as distinct from the building. Moreover, um, the tendency is to um, think of uh, the, the organically inherited community in a slightly romanticized way and to value community, but neglect it at the same time. So it's incredibly important. I really love community. My community is so important, right? And yet not to invest in it, because we're investing in the new, the innovative, the um, exciting things. We are at an acute point of that in the United States with declining communities, opiate epidemics, and a whole variety of issues um, that I don't have time to talk about that are part of um, what's at stake here. The, um, Decline of community can be measured, among other things, in the average age of communities in some cases. Um, that is, communities exist in which young people cannot make a future, so they leave. So the community gets older. Um, an unhappy fate for a community. Right? Now, I um, want to suggest a way of thinking about what community is, is that can underpin paying more attention to how we construct life. Um, and uh, um, and I will only suggest, not go through any detail. Um, if we imagine community, right, we need to think about what it is we value, what's available to build, how this works. Uh, community, I want to suggest, is some sort of complex network phenomena of social relationships. And it can exist in place-based forms, right, a small town, and in not so place-based form, a professional community, you know, fellow engineers, other other kinds of professional communities that, um, as uh, a researcher once put it, are communities without community. The relationships 
right, are varied. There are different kinds of relationships. We could potentially measure a community, the density of relationships, how many of the possible relationships are um, actual of each other. In the multiplexity, how many different things go on in each relationship? We some, but tend to see something as more community-like when people know each other, not just in one context, but in multiple contexts. So that the people you work with and the people um, you um, enjoy leisure time with, the people you go to church with, the people you're politically mobilized with are the same people, right? This should be recognizable as a variable. It's not always that. Um, and very well is systematicity. So we have, we can get more precise about how we imagine community. There's a component that is more cultural, of recognition of the community, in which naming it is important. And we say things like, I live in Glendale, or something. Um, and, the community has that. and that's also an official status. Right? Now, this is, I'm not intending to lay out the whole thing. Just say, there'd be a lot of things we could then begin to unpack, as I was going to begin, and how do we organize? Our imagining of community tends to think of it as smaller right, um, than um, uh, the whole country or something like that. But we are consistent in that. We talk about the national community and so forth. Now, we have projects like the creative place making that is an active thing at ASU, and I think an important thing, that call for us to begin to unpack and take seriously what's what makes community work? What is it that makes us value it? What goes on in face-to-face -face relationships that doesn't in others? What goes on in directly interpersonal relationships that's different from the inter um, indirect? The, and um, to what extent is what we call community, for example, um, an adaptive system right, that is um, not governed, right? but um, in a dispersed, continual adaptation response to various forces. And what are the forces that matter? Um, a key point is that all the communities, I think, um, if I just went around and said everybody think of community, that anybody could point out, turn out to be parts, not wholes. But our imagining of what makes community, how it works, is a fairly holistic Imaginary. We tend to have it say that place, the small town, and our imagery of that has boundaries, right? What it is is, of course, influenced by larger scale systems. Is Walmart building um, a big box store? Is that destroying the downtown of the community, right? Is there waste? I mean, what's going on? Now, I'm trying to about that. What is the infrastructure for being able to have community? Let me recall, take a, a an odd, I was about to say out of the box example, but you'll see it's a not good term. We're thinking about Andrew Maynard's work, which many of you will know, and the idea of community in a box. Right? The idea of if we were going to create communities in space, what would go into it? Now, is it community in a box? Is it the infrastructure of community in a box? Is it the conditions for community? Would that include legal frameworks? Would it include constitution? What role would imagination play? We are engaged in making and remaking community all the time. Um, not always enough, we sometimes neglect it. But it's a reinvention most of the time. The community in a box in space is a sort of extreme case of almost a complete novelty, but even then, are likely to be hugely influenced by prior examples. In Mesa, or in any other sort of everyday examples of this. We have an inheritance, a legacy. There are things already there. And we have a path-dependent structure. So we are engaged in reinvention, not pure invention, in making the new in the context of the old, in um, reimagining what's going on, and in, of course, deploying technologies and socio-technical systems to do it. Uh, in all of this uh, conclusion, we are facing a series of unintended consequences that are always um, with us in this. So um, every one of these processes we're making reorganizes things. Think of um, the relationship of place-based communities 
Um, there's the district two systems that distribute wealth, and the other side of that coin, systems that distribute ilth. Ilth is actually not a term in our everyday imaginaries. We don't have the term for the opposite of wealth most of the time. Ilth is actually a word coined by John Ruskin in the 19th century, one of the founders of the arts and crafts movement. Um, right? But if we don't have a gross national production of ilth index. We don't have the environmental justice movement is largely a movement trying to look at who bears the consequences of the distribution of bad stuff as distinct from the distribution of good stuff. To reconceptualize inequality, poverty, and injustice in terms of proximity to things like toxic waste as well as simply the absence of money or something else. And to look at how minority communities, or poor communities, or others are affected by this. So we take on, I think, a need close with, um, to work on our imaginations, not just to unpack and ask ourselves how we are habitually imagining, but to work on what we are missing in order to better imagine these constitutive terms of the social imaginary. Corporations, communities, right, even infrastructure or technologies, innovation, all of them um, are in need of some um, rethinking. The rethinking needs to be in close connection to empirical reality and to research on what's actually going on, the expensive science that drives the herd ranking. But it also needs some of the cheaper science of the theoretical reflection on this, which enables us to re-examine the social imagination at work. Thanks. Oh yeah, I forgot to say interrupt me so you didn't. <laughs> but that's yeah, please. I am Greg Zachary. In the early 2000s, you supported an interesting project on transnational communities. Mm -hmm. Just two general questions to try to help locate what you were talking about. So how do you locate your thinking in terms of these well-established frameworks by Benedict Anderson on Imagined Communities and, say, by Ranger and Hobsbawm in the book Invention of Tradition, both of which I've, I've used in my own work yeah. very extensively. And then on more contemporary matters, you know, what's the effect of internet and social media on concepts of community since concepts, you know, communities have really been reconfigured because of these technologies? And it may be that the kinds of communities you're thinking about don't even exist anymore. And so you can't measure the vitality of communities by metrics that are uploaded. And that's what it seemed to me you were suggesting. OK, great questions, um, specific and close to my heart. Uh, let me try to take them sort of in the order you presented them, but with an eye oh, no, I mean, I'm just to the last part, which is the, the big question, right? Is this part. Um, so, Benedict Anderson um, writes what I think is maybe the single most interesting and important book in the broad field of trying to understand nationalism and nations, but also more generally a key one in this thinking of imagined, uh, imagination, social imaginaries. Um, and his book, Imagined Communities, talks about nations and the ways in which they're imagined. I'm going to try to reproduce everything, but two things. So one, he points out, um, that we have to ask, what are they like? And the answer is um, often things like religions or um, other cultural phenomena, other ways of imagining what's important and who belongs with whom and what's going on, um, rather than um, necessarily um, their political alternatives, their narrow political alternatives. So it's a question of broad cultures of imagination. He then points out that this has become a nearly ubiquitous global phenomenon. That it's not hard for anything to claim to be a nation without participating in this nationalist imaginary called a modularity. So he tries to trace, does it start in the Spanish colonies of the New World and spread? Where does it go? I think that's not material here, but modularity is, right? Because part of what he puts on the table is how does a way of imagining pulling things into being by imagination become reproducible and standard 
And here I would just point to a, there are other literatures that connect to this. Those of you who know the um, institutionalist literature and sociology, so I knew economic sociology, but uh, you know, Meyer and various scholars will know. There's a whole discussion of, of things like um, what, how do you recognize a nation state? The former Soviet Union breaks <laughs> up. There are a variety of proposals from different um, uh, polities that would like to be recognized by the United Nations. Well, what are the things that go on? Well, there's a huge structure of imitation. Right? Around the world, the cabinets and the division of ministries is almost identical. Right? Capitalist, communist, large country, small country, developed, underdeveloped, Everybody has right, a foreign minister, has some sort of interior ministry, has right, a uh, defense department, a right, health department, that there are these breakup. As though everybody went to the Kennedy School at Harvard and got a master's degree that told them how to do that. Well, that's one of the mechanisms, Harvard, right, and textbooks. But it's also a mechanism of mutual recognition, right? Um, and so we have a huge project of imitation and mutual recognition that instantiates and gives force to this, right? It's also things like, do you have a ballet folklorico, and do you have a national costume and things? But you know that. now that's all about recognizing, like how would you and know you were a nation if you say, hey, we Azeris deserve to have an independent Azerbaijan. Right? But the other side of it, from, um, he wants to say, from within is how do people imagine it into being? And he says there are various, what I would call, technologies of imagination, the census, for example or the ritual phenomenon of reading the newspaper in the morning. Here's one that's almost disappeared from the internet. Just let me take an example. One of his prime examples, newspaper reading, in which you can imagine yourself reading the newspaper over, you can sit there reading the newspaper and having your cup of coffee in the morning, and imagine everyone else in the country doing it, and that's a way of having an imagination in the whole. Now it's just that's broken down, and people don't do that in sufficient numbers for that to work. People my age still think other people do that, but they don't, right? And this is an impact um, of electronic media, among other things, and that has just changed how we get news, changed when we do it. Um, I still actually subscribe to a paper newspaper, but you know, I start looking at it and say, I've already read all of these things online last night, the day before, or it's sort of annoying that the New York Times prints articles over a sort of five-day span, they don't come in the same order, right? It's, you know, that, Imaginary is dying, right? Says, what about the museum? The way in which we produce artifacts and display them and give accounts of them that is representative of the nation or of any other polity and so forth. Um, maps, right? Um, so anyway, the, the Anderson is extremely close to what I'm going to suggest, <coughs> and it points out that there can be transformation in these technologies that underpin imaginaries. And I think that that's crucial in hardware pointing. Um, I'm going to say that Hobsbawm and Ranger, for all of the, the um, quality, this is an edited collection, there are several different chapters which are really good and interesting on different things, like kilts and how they get the Scotsman kilt is a real, the tartan plaid, a re recent, not an ancient invention. It's a book called The Invention of Tradition that, to my mind, oddly misses the point that all traditions are invented. It's set up as though there were something that could be called real traditions that weren't invented, and then recently invented traditions where there was something self-conscious about the invention that are invented traditions. Um, I would like to contest that. I say, no, all traditions are invented. There are people who are more engaged in tradition inventing than others, and this is part of what I mean by reworking the social imaginary. So there are you know, creators of films and writers of novels and academics who are more engaged in this work than others. They are the griot and the, the shaman of the societies. And how we do that matters. So the individual case studies, Hobson and Ranger, uh, and Ranger, are terrific, but we ought to see them as cases of the way in which the world gets made. It gets made by inventing traditions. So things are not odd by being invented, that's normal, and they're not odd by being traditions, as though that's against the rational and the practical. That's actually how we get the rational practical ways to do things. So take that together to your real point about, isn't all of this changing when measured by metrics? I think it's all changing, but it is not the case that people no longer care about um, 
face-to-face -face relations are that they are entirely dispersed. Um, behaviorally, people still form groups, but the groups aren't necessarily the same kind of groups they were before. Um, so we need to think about what's going on and rethink that. But transnational communities are a good example. You take sort of, um, whether community is the right word, we've got to decide for a moment, but um, a diasporic population, right, Sikhs. Sikhs around the world maintain connections with other Sikhs. Whether we want to call those community or society or culture, I, mean, let's not, I don't want to quibble on the word, but say that, that there is an investment, right? And they may be more invested in that than in being um, in Toronto, right? And so the Sikhs in London, the Sikhs in Toronto, and the Sikhs in various cities maintain a variety of connections. How do they do it? They use communications technologies. They use a common imagining, and they have sort of technologies of imagining. Um, Diasporic Chinese, you know, they, um, China, there, there's a, a, a Latin American diaspora of Chinese, and there are a variety of ways in which they stay in touch. There's a, um, a there are beauty pageants, you know, Miss Chinatown around um, Latin America. There are, are um, a whole production. You know, um, Jews in the United States, this Nordic population, worried about losing identity. Well, there are summer camps where you can meet a nice Jewish girl. Um, there are a whole variety of possible institutional strategies, technologies, if you will, for trying to sustain the combination that I want to say is the metric, networks, right, and recognition, right, the cultural identification. And um, sometimes these fail, right, and that community disappears. Sometimes they succeed. With regard to place-based communities, which are interesting, I actually think it's a very important question Will we renew them? We won't renew, we won't all live in small towns. In that sense, they have to, you know, this is a declining form of life. That doesn't mean we don't have relations to natural environments. It doesn't matter whether we're next to the toxic dump or next to the uh, job providing business. Um, the, but that may be playing out in an entirely urbanized planet. Right? So that the old image, which was tied to rural, small town community, city, is all shot, etc., is missing planetary urbanization. Right? We're sort of increasingly the whole world is connected into um, urban infrastructures and ways of life. But within those, there are communal niches which may prosper or decline um, in various ways, which may be maintained, and which often have a, a tremendous amount of staying power, as certain small ethnic communities um, in large cities do. Some folks may have to go, but I want to get at least one more question in. I have to answer it more briefly. <laughs> you still get to choose. Maybe you shouldn't take my questions. So, I mean, my question, to put it pretty simply, is you just used the phrase technologies that underpin imaginaries in relation to, um, to census and so forth. But I wonder if you would reflect on um, or speak to the question of how one would approach um, the, the reverse of that, imaginaries that underpin. Technology. We talk quite a lot about society and about infrastructures and technologies in the sort of infrastructure side. But it seems to me that, that one can ask questions about the ways in which um, technological regimes are enacted that are precisely regulated by the kinds of imaginaries that you made reference to. For example, the notion that society is impacted upon, that one can only ask questions about effects and not about causes and, and so on and so forth. Because this is, of course, you know, a, a, a kind of a fundamental division in certain domains of yeah. social science where the discovery of society taken as the object is to the occlusion of these other things and yet the discovery of society and those other things is, is uh, perhaps a, um, a insufficiently interrogated problem. So I completely agree. Um, I tried to at least acknowledge this dimension obviously didn't do it very well. So um, briefly I, I would say um, first my very point about romanticization of the new and versus infrastructure is intended to be one a, a gesture towards that sort of imaginary regime. Um, those things that are the objects of exciting new investment in which you can make a fortune building a startup company look one way, and those things which are maintenance burdens on the polity um, look another. Um, and, and, and there are lots of those kinds of regimes and, and oppositions. The, um, categorical distinctions, the idea that there is society 
economy, polity, but then also the difference from technology, the material, um, the way we organize. So every introductory sociology book is colluding in a reproduction of a world that every undergraduate, almost every undergraduate engineering curriculum is also colluding in, and the association of engineers who tell you what can be in an undergraduate engineering curriculum include in, in which there's a sharp division between the social and material technologies. Um, many practically engineers know there's not because they're, they're wrestling with how to solve a concrete problem and realizing it's both. That they can't distinguish the pricing mechanism from the uh, you know, um, technology, right? So that how are you going to charge people for riding in your new um, bullet train? Well, you can use sensors, you can use this, and there, you know, it becomes a social economic question too. So I, I won't try to give more examples, say to say, absolutely. The deep, big distinctions need to be interrogated, like society versus technology. And the regime, there we need to look for regimes that purport to order and regulate these systems, uh, these, these ways of thinking, um, because they shape how we imagine what's possible and what is merely a constraint to which we have to adapt um, in the world. And I think that that's, that is a huge impact on this. And we, academics, um, collude in, in the reproduction of these ways of thinking as though they were naturally given, as, rather than um, as though they were imaginaries that are potentially reimaginable. Yeah. Make this the last one. Okay. Uh, to check out your profile on ASU. So to prepare for this a little bit. And you mentioned that there's a need for creativity, solidarity, and determination in order to achieve sustainable futures. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. The implicit characterization of the problem of transitioning and also uh, the need for this particular solution. The um, I'll try. The the um, issue of sustainable futures. Um, I think widely within the ASU community will be recognized as an issue that has to involve um, all of the different components of our lives as we go in the future. Right? So it's a question that is um, economic, a question that is agricultural and food, food intensive, and right? it has all these components. Um, the way, like the previous question, the way in which we think about each of these components and they're well, they separate but there's relations. So when we say, oh yes, there's a place for social science in our global futures project, is it a discrete place and where is it located? Is it pervasive and all around these questions? The, um, when I said solidarity, um, I really meant trying to um, uh, deeply respect our interdependence with each other and translate that into a sense of mutuality um, in this, as distinct from the imaginaries that are often possessive individualist, property holding individual in their understandings of what go on. So what I was trying to allude to um, with through my very brief gesture about genetic engineering, that we fall back on a notion of individual property holding, like parents will decide over their children, um, in the absence of enough thinking about how we want to create a sustainable future in an era where we have the potential to reorganize the genome in part. Um, the determination, yeah, these aren't easy. <laughs> this is going to take a collective determination. Solidarity is going to have to be um, a basis for um, political and public solidarity to act on these things, because otherwise, um, what we get is action organized within the existing market-based individual sort of structures, and nothing but the cumulative results of that rather than the ability to make choices. Um, and finally, um, sustainability um, understood either narrowly about uh, sustainability, narrowly about the sustainability of life, or a little bit more broadly about the sustainability of other things we value, cultures or whatever, um, isn't going to happen automatically. It's, it is going to require a capacity to make collective determined 
choices to do this solidary determinant work, or we won't have sustainability. And uh, um, I think we are pushed by a variety of the climate change and other huge um, pressures that we face, transformations, including the technological transformations, to confront the fact that um, if we don't have determined solidary efforts to reimagine and to change, um, we will get um, uh, an unsustainable, possibly extremely chaotic, um, damaging future. That sounds a lot like the present. The unsustainable present is that which is governed by the law of entropy in which we um, are increasingly at odds with ourselves and our existence. Thank you very much.